Welcome to Iowa Post Game here from the Hawkeye of the Storm, brought to you by Iowa Smokehouse. If you want a better quality snack for game day or any day, of course, in the midst of football, basketball crossover season, as well as hockey, NBA hoops, whatever you're into. Of course, the NFL playoffs are right around the corner. Visit iowasmokehouse.com for a full lineup sure to satisfy you and your family's snacking needs. They've got beef jerky. They've got meat sticks, delicious steak bites. They're tender. They are yummy, and they also have ketchups, barbecue sauces, and salsas. You'll never need to go anywhere else, and you'll never need to leave your home because you can have it shipped right to your door with free shipping on $50 orders. Again, it's iowasmokehouse.com. Use the code Hawkeyes for 15% off your order and free shipping with $50 orders. I am Corey Brady, your host here from the Hawkeye of the Storm, Iowa Post Game here, talking about Iowa and the men with their 103-74 win over the Huskies of Northern Illinois. Big Ten Plus game. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get thousands of people in here on a Friday night while there's football going and other things happening for people to react to a game that was on BTN Plus. And we'll start with our first Iowa Smokehouse caller of the day. And that is uh, Doug himself. Doug, you have BTN Plus, right? Yep, and that's the reason why we didn't go to the game today. I told my dad we already sent the nine ninety five, so we're staying home. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we don't, as you can tell, we don't have Coach Close on with us tonight. Uh, Coach is expected to join us again on Tuesday. Big game for the men on yes. Tuesday against Wisconsin on the road. Are you going up to Madison for that one, Doug? Probably not. Uh, I, I, I have work and stuff. And weekday games are just really hard. We did go to the game last Wednesday. And uh, no, there was there were still lines for ice cream, but there was no lines in the restroom, which was really weird. 
it felt like a, a snow game, like a snow, like a, there was a blizzard, how, how few people there were, but the weather was perfectly fine. So it was a little different. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to uh, the band and the cheerleaders because I've went to games, you know, those tournaments, you know, in Florida and San Diego, they really helped make it a college atmosphere and they deserve credit when there's nobody there given their enthusiasm and stuff like that, because it makes it at least feel like it's a college basketball game. Do you want to guess what the announced attendance was tonight? Seven or eight. I mean, I'm, that's what they're, that's what they'll claim. I don't, you know, well, no, actually they're claiming 11, eight. All right. That's the official box score attendance number for Carver. And it, it well, I'll give him credit. It was more full than we've seen it, mm-hmm. but, yeah. um, I don't know if that's a result of more people have the weekend off and it's kind of a holiday weekend. So I don't know. I mean, if nobody had shown up, we would have had people saying, well, it's a holiday, Corey. You can't expect people to show up. So I, I don't know. Um, you you announced something uh, that was earlier today about our tight end. Um, yeah. We got um, last Wednesday, uh, I was debating with my dad because I go, they're not that big. Um, tight end, you sat down below us. We went to the student section because there was – room everywhere and Lachey and all and I don't know who the third tight end were sitting and they were they were just bombarded with kids. So I'm really happy to see Lachey come back. And it was just ironic. We saw him last week at the game and at least there was three students there. Uh and I we were joking those guys don't be rich here. They're probably already getting tons of NIL money. But uh those yeah, guys took it. every picture. It was amazing. So yeah uh, they're they're you know Eric all um I don't know if you know any of his backstory, um, mm-hmm. Doug, but uh, go look up Eric Michigan. Hall's. Yeah, he transferred, of course, from Michigan. But if you look up uh, his backstory, he was saved as a child, I believe, from a fire. And okay. um, it really affected his life. I believe ESPN College Game Day did a special on him when he was at Michigan. But really interesting story. He's got a young child, a, a, a kid himself. So, you know, that that changes you. And, and Luke Lachey has been through a lot, too. Had to pay his dues, wait behind a, a great in Sam Laporta. And, mm-hmm. you know, then he, you know, tears his ankle or whatever he did, broke his ankle earlier this year. And so, yeah, that, that's a good, group, really good group of guys. A lot of high character in that in that room. I wish I knew who the third one was, but they didn't turn down a single kid. And it was, it was probably um, Addison Estringa or, yeah. or Stephen Stilley. I assume they're all three tight ends with Lachey and all, but I don't know who the third one was. But they yeah. were just really nice guys. We did. I told my dad, we're, we're we're forty and sixty. We're not going down and ask for autographs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, well, I'm just curious. What did you think of of tonight? Besides the fact that you know, not much defense from the Huskies. That's the team that's not get back in transition. Obviously, Iowa didn't play good defensively in the first half. I thought they were fine in the second half, did what they needed to do, of course. But have you, from your perspective, because you're an avid basketball guy, no, have you learned anything from these last three games? Say, no, no. I, I, they're the same team I thought they were. Um, they don't have to outscore people, and they don't have to not have droughts. Um, they have droughts. I was very happy. I kept track of this. Uh the first 10 minutes, which would be like the third quarter, um, they went 30, uh, the score would, in that third quarter, that meaning from halftime to the 10 minute mark, uh, they outscored uh, Northern Illinois 31 to 13, which I, that made me pretty happy, you know, and uh, they only gave up 26 points throughout the whole second half, which is a lot better than 48. <laughs> um, but this team at times looks lost on defense. And um, I don't know, some of that, you, I'm not like, like I said, I'm a JV all star. I just believe you just have, you have to talk and you have to, you know, um, there's times that it seems like they don't know when they're, what they're supposed to do. <laughs> and they're, they're not talking to each other and, and rotating and moving. And um, again, I don't know what their scheme necessarily is supposed to be. Um, there's times that I didn't think, I don't think that uh, three quarter court press really does much other than slows it down a little bit. Um, sometimes they get turnovers out of it, but, um, I, again, I, I, I didn't, I was on the same boat. I, I wasn't that more optimistic than I think you were. I, I thought, you know, somewhere 18, 19 wins. Um, the, the three games after Wisconsin, I think are more important than, than the Wisconsin game because Wisconsin games at Wisconsin, 
you've got to protect the home court. Can't lose to Rutgers and Nebraska on their home court if you want any chance of making the NCAA tournament or just even having a winning season. I, I think that you just, like I said, you have to win almost every game at home from here on out. I know Purdue will probably be the hardest one. I don't expect that. Um, and the I'm problem hoping- is they've already fallen behind because they've yeah. already lost one at home. You know, yeah. and that's to a bad Michigan. I mean, that Michigan team they is lost not good. They lost to the- McNeese. Yep, the guy in the you chat know, was saying that. Just for some context for people, because I know you you know this, Doug, but for some context for people who wonder uh, about this Michigan team. Now, keep in mind, they beat Iowa here. Uh, let me pull up the score. Was that two weeks ago or was it even two weeks ago, Doug? Barely two weeks uh, ago. Yeah. yeah, they beat Iowa. Let's see. Final mm-hmm. score was that was December um, 90 to 80, mm-hmm. right? That was in Carver. Um, they proceeded to lose to Florida. And that's not a, a bad loss. I don't know much about the Gators this year, but they lost to Florida in double overtime, beat Eastern Michigan. Tonight they lost by 11 to McNeese State. And put that in context, McNeese, Michigan by far, the biggest name on their schedule thus far. McNeese did have a win against VCU, but they had win. Their other wins were against Champion Christian, Bible Studies College. <laughs> Lat- I'm, not, I'm not joking. Lat- no. Lat- no. I and didn't they, lost, that. they lost to West Carolina. Um, so I don't know anything about Mc, McNeese. Uh, they beat Mississippi United. So, like, that's just a, a miserable loss, regardless of what, what McNeese's record was. They're now 11-2. and two. Uh, Michigan's now under 500. I, I would mm-hmm. guess that's the first time that has occurred this late into a season in a long time for them, I would guess. Um, I, I don't remember. I mean, before the line, you know. Yeah. yeah. And they I mean, got them before they got them before Juwan Howard came back in a full time capacity. I just don't know how you explain that one. And they were thoroughly beat in that game. We all watched that game. So they did what they need to do these last three games. I think you heard me say, Doug, after that Michigan game, it was like, okay, now they need two to three weeks with finals and just holiday break. And they just need two to three weeks to kind of regroup and improve on some things. And we won't know until we watch them against Big Ten competition. But um, I tell you, uh, Gary Close, I don't think Coach Close would mind me saying this. He was texting me during the game this evening, and he's not with us because he's he's traveling home at the moment. But uh, Gary did make an interesting comment to me, and I think he's right. And I won't share all of it, but what, basically the gist of it is I was going to be going from one extreme to the other extreme Tuesday. You know, this Northern Illinois team didn't play on speck of defense <laughs> they, they don't play a lick of fast at one that game was extremely fast at one point and not just that that we we got done with the first half when it took about 40 minutes that was a fast game um i don't yeah but yeah but so my point is they're going to be going i mean he's right that you're going from zero to 60 and that no resistance tonight especially in transition wisconsin is as good as they've been defensively in quite some time Obviously, Iowa has a track record of struggling up there. They struggled against Wisconsin. They've struggled against Wisconsin of late in general, even at home. Yeah. So I don't, it's just going to be a, a very tenuous Tuesday night. If they can somehow go up there and get a win, it will do bounds and leaps and bounds for the confidence of this group. But I, I don't see that happening. I, I don't either. And, that, and, and um, you know, I, I'm like you said, I'm a homer. But I'm realistic. I, I think the next three games after that are very important. The the road game at Minnesota. If you are don't pick a if you don't if you don't win a road game, more likely it has to be Penn State and Minnesota. I mean I I and um you know and I I we want to play in Nebraska at home. Rutgers um you know they're not a killer. They've had a couple of bad losses too. I think. Um, well, but, just to, just so people know what we're talking about here, I'm going to go ahead and throw up. Appreciate the comment there from Brent. Again, Iowa defeating Northern Illinois, 103-74, and uh, somewhat of a barn burner affair when you score, you know, combined about 180 points. Um, Take you over. A whole lot of defense going on, especially when you're talking Big Ten versus G5, or in this case, MAC. Uh, but I want to share the schedule just so people know exactly what Doug is talking about here. This is a copy of uh, Iowa's upcoming schedule. And as you'll see here, uh, I'll throw us down here to the corner so people can kind of get an idea here. So, again, um, 
January 2nd against you got Wisconsin. And then, as Doug said, a couple of home games that are very winnable. And you also have kind of a gap in here, right? You don't play. You get five days off. You get Rutgers and Nebraska back to back at home with a nice break in between. Hate the Friday and Monday. They play uh, Nebraska Friday, right? And then they play uh, Minnesota Monday, if you go down. Um, that's a good question. Uh, January 15th is – just confirm that. Yeah, January 15th is a Monday, and uh, you're right. Uh, Nebraska is on that, that previous Friday. I don't like uh, that. Why? Uh, I, 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 well, I'm old school. I like Wednesday, Saturday. Um, I just think that's a, 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 a short turnaround – um, and you're you happen to go on the road after well, playing the game, and you know what? Uh, suck it up because <laughs> they, guess what? They guess what, Doug? They got Purdue on the twentieth, and <laughs> if you if you trip up in either one of these three games, yep. At, at best, you're going to be what? Uh, let's see. Lot they'd be zero and three heading into these games. So say you would just win two of those. Would they be two and five after Purdue? Yep. That you can't be two and five. <laughs> yep. That's the reason why I said with two home losses. That's the reason why I said those three games are very yeah, pivotal. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I mean, it, is, it, it doesn't like if we we want them to have the best season possible. For them to have the best season possible, they need to win those three games, I believe, and I think most people would agree um, because, like you said, we can't be one and six or two and five or you know even three and four is not that good, but you know. Well, um, Rutgers can beat people, yeah. and Minnesota's not very good, but neither is Iowa right now. And Nebraska's not very good, but neither is Iowa right now. <laughs> I could see Iowa beating, you know, maybe two thirds of the teams in the schedule, but I could also see any team knock Iowa off if they play to their floor, which we've seen them do a couple of times this year. I mean, I think they played, I know they played good Iowa State, you know, a good Iowa State team, good uh, Purdue team. There have been a couple of these halves against these mid-majors that have been really, really uneventful and yes. unimpressive. And they've they've turned it on when they've needed to, but that's an indication to me that this team, I mean, good teams, even good teams, would have put this Husky team away in the first 10 minutes. Yep. I mean, they were so bad defensively. Yep. I have, I'm going to go with two questions, and I don't know how many people you have in the queue or not, but uh, my first question goes back to, and especially with some of the drama that's going on in the Big Ten, and I don't want to get into that. How many teams? And I said four might be realistic. There's six on um, Lenardi's. I know you don't care about the bracketology people right now, but um, but how many do you think realistically the Big Ten will get into the tournament? Lenardi's only got six right now. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. What did uh, did you look at Mike DeCourcy? Mm -mm. Okay, because he came out with a bracket earlier today. And the only reason I know that is because I saw Fox Sports tweeted it out. I mean, that'd be just be spitballing. I have a hard time seeing the Big Ten getting less than eight right now. Just in oh. this day and age, I shot six is just shocking to me to hear. And you know, there I, are I some check that, but I think Lenardi had six and yeah, there are some had... middling teams in this conference. Don't get me wrong, but there are also some middling teams in a lot of conferences. I don't mm -hmm. think it's a real strong year anywhere in college basketball. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is? I mean, well, the, I'm in Big 12 country as you are. The Big 12 thinks they're amazing, so I don't well, know. <laughs> that's fine. The Big Big 12 thinks it's amazing. The ACC, I think Purdue right now is the best team in the country, and it's because they have the best player in the country and the most dominant, uh, the most dominant force in the country. I think that's fair to say, but I just don't see a whole lot. I mean, I don't see the Gonzagas of the world, or I'm trying to think of you know, recent, uh, you know, the strong Duke teams or the strong UNC teams or Kansas teams. I mean, Kansas might end up being a Final Four team again. I mean, they got a lot of pieces and they added Hunter Dick Dickinson this year. Yeah. But they he's had some issues. Mm -hmm. They've had some problems with him down there. Have you been following that storyline? Not much. I know that I, there was a couple articles. I'm trying not to click on too much stuff. <laughs> well, and then you have the Illinois situation. I don't think Illinois is maybe Final Four material. But that is a uh, groundbreaking, and I know you said you didn't want to cover that, but that's a huge story, yeah. not just for the Big Ten, but for the sport. Yeah. And because that, he, he's, he might be done. I mean, we don't know this, but he could very well be done. Yeah, and, and um, you know, like with with that, he he was in talk of – I mean, Edie's definitely a player of the year, but – and I even said this a couple weeks ago when they played uh, that uh, Maui fundraiser that I really thought he was 
one of the best players in the Big Ten. He is one of the best players in the Big Ten. And uh, yeah. so this on is both ends. on yeah. both ends. Um, I don't know what that means. We played Illinois twice at the end of the year. Um, my last kind of question is with lineups. Um, do you have any thoughts about the lineup? Now Perkins is playing the one starting there. Uh, he's went bigger. Brock didn't get many minutes today, but Brock didn't, you know, the inconsistency of some of the freshmen. Owen's really the only freshman that seems to be consistent. Um, any thoughts about the starting lineup and then the rotation? Well, Brock only played 13 minutes. He was, uh, had a three to one turnover, assist turnover. <laughs> yeah, only took four shots, was 0 for 4. I didn't think he played badly when he's in there. I just think he deserves more minutes than that. Uh, and he's going to be up and down. You're going to get that with these freshmen. But you know who also has been up and down through their careers? Peyton Sanford and Tony Perkins. So, you know, you're going to need guard play. And I don't know yeah. that running Tony at the at the one and Josh at the two. Like, I don't know Josh Dix right now is a three-point shooter. I don't know where his confidence level is. But that's a concern to me because if they're going to run that older lineup mm -hmm. with with Tony and Dix at the, at the two guard spots, somebody's got to knock down threes, and neither totally. one of those guys are hitting right now. Price, I know that they were trying to get him in there, and you know, Price, Josh, somebody needs to step up and hit threes. I know they made eight today. Um, the walk-ons came in and really wrecked, wrecked our percentage, but you know uh, that's okay. I want to see Carter make a couple eventually. But well, um, what's crazy is I'm looking at the numbers and and. You know, Dix is shooting 36.8% from three on the year, which is not bad. How many attempts uh, a game? It's not great, but uh, he's got, uh, let's see, how many attempts per game? 1.6 attempts per game. Um, But that's not very high. I mean, he needs to, he, to me, volume. He's He's got the potential to be a volume shooter. Maybe I didn't watch enough of Josh Dix out of high school, but he's got such a good-looking <laughs> shot. And mm -hmm. I know he's a scorer, and maybe there's still some – you know, if there's any insecurities about that leg, you'd think maybe it'd be a little bit more, he'd be a little bit more apt to spot up more yeah. on the outside, but we don't see him doing that a lot. He's just not real aggressive with his with his uh, shot right now. It seems like Josh and, and uh, the younger Stafford kid, Price, could be really good shooters and should be good shooters. And yeah. we've seen Peyton go off. And so I, I have hope there is some three-point shooting. I don't know what Brock and Bowen bring as far as three-point shooting. Do you think they could become good three-point shooters or service? I saw Brock make a lot of threes in high school. But, um, you know, DeSante not proven anything to me as far as consistency. He's kind of like Aaron Eulis. Like, hey, he can knock him down, but he hasn't shown himself to be a good three-point shooter. Brock does not have confidence, I don't think, from outside right now. Um, you know, Brock is going to be, to me, this is Brock's future based on what I've seen. Brock is going to be a dangerous player in college if – he starts letting it fly from outside. Yeah. But a player that player that has some of the disadvantages he has from a size perspective, I don't know that you can be really good at this level unless you are really good from outside, like Jordan Bohannon. Now, I think Brock, there's no question, Brock Harding has a lot better speed. I think he's more athletic than Jordan, without question. But like Jordan Bohannon, imagine if he was not a good three-point shooter, he wouldn't even have been a walk-on and we may have been a walk-on but i mean what would he bring to the what would, i'm serious i'm not being i'm not ripping yeah, on no, you like, I, I would be up there. Yep. he's a, a spot-up shooter and brock is a good ball handler can attack the rim but he's undersized got really good vision so kudos to him but he's got to knock down threes at some point and mm -hmm. I, I do think that's a confidence thing because i thought he's got he's got kind of a rushed shot right now it seems to me i don't know if you've noticed the same no, thing. I, yes um and i wanted to ask coach close about his form because coach is obviously it looks like a small guy. I was a small guy. It looks like a small guy shooting form, if that makes any sense. I don't know if that makes yeah. any sense what I just said, but it looks like what a small guy would shoot like. Right. Um, I guess before I get off, rebounding would be the other thing. We well, I think we out rebounded North Northern Illinois. Um, again, I think uh, Ben had about seven. Um, where where do you think the rebounding is coming from, and who do you think uh, are who do you think needs to step up? Patrick did have one good rebounding game, but I think he only had two in this game. Um, I don't think, you know, we go with that bigger lineup. I expect to out-rebound teams, but they're not very physical. <laughs> well, first of all, Ben Crickey is our RTI Threads player of the game because he's, this is what he's given you right now. He's given you 15, I don't know what his averages are, but he's given you 15 to 20 a night, and he's giving you six to eight rebounds a night. And honestly, I mean, he's playing a lot of minutes, so he better be able to, to give you six to eight rebounds a night. But if you had told me preseason, hey, you'd be you'd be getting that amount of boards out of 
Cricky on a night and night basis, I'd probably take it because he was not very good at Valpo on the glass. So his efficiency inside, he's got a really nice mid-range shot. He's their best player right now. Overall, he is. It's not Peyton Sanford. Like, I mean, I'm just, it's just not. Yeah. He's not consistent enough. And, um, you know, Peyton, I don't know. Well, let me look at what Peyton's final numbers were. Um, you know, Peyton added seven boards. So that's, you know, that's the thing about Peyton. If he can, you know, give you six to eight rebounds and Cricky can give you six to eight rebounds, you know, you'd love to get more than two rebounds out of Patrick McCaffrey. But, you know, at some point you kind of feel like that ship has sailed. Like it, he is what he is on the glass. I just, you know, he is. Um, You'd also like to get more than nine points out of your most experienced player who was once a four-star recruit at a high school. But I think he is what he is right now. Do you think Tony's a good rebounding guard? I think he could be. Do I think he is? No, not right now. Well, I'm going to leave it. Yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Like I said, the last three games, they did what we probably thought they would do. We still have tons of questions about um, defense. Uh, I, I just asked the question about rebounding. Um, you know, again, the Wisconsin game is a big game, but the three games after Wisconsin, I think are just huge. Uh, if, if, if this team wants to achieve any postseason, they need to do something in those next three games. Real quick, Doug, let me read you through. This is Mike DeCorsi, who I have a lot of respect for. And again, mm-hmm. these brackets, we're talking early projections. It well, almost nothing. I was going to ask you, what sources do you, after listening to you, know, with the, I've never clicked on that Wisconsin page. I would have never known anything about that unless you told oh, me. Oh, it shows. Somebody sent it to me, of course. Okay. Let me, let me read you to the Big Ten teams. Now, keep track of these as I'm going, Doug. Count these up as I go. So according to Mike DeCourcy, his projection right now, by the way, he's got McNeese State in the tournament. So as an at-large, or excuse me, not as an at-large, as, as an AQ. But he's got Indiana, Illinois, um, Ohio State, it's three, Northwestern's four, Wisconsin's five, and Purdue is six. He's got Michigan State and uh, Utah State in a play-in game, so there's seven. He's got Nebraska in as eight, so he's got eight. He's kind of right where I'm at without looking at it. He, he's got eight in. I think six is really drastically low. I Just going off of history and the committee, I, I have a hard time seeing the committee putting less than less than eight, definitely a lot less than seven. I can't imagine six. He has uh, Michigan State in a playing game, though. Yes, he did. And he what, does. what does he have Nebraska at? He's got Nebraska as an 11. Not Yeah, he's got Nebraska as an 11. I mean, that's not too far. I mean, again, uh, those are probably the eight teams right now that you could say would be in. Uh, I did see a power ranking. Uh, again, I, I should stop clicking on stuff myself. That had us as 13 out of the 14 teams in the Big Ten. I sure hope we're better than that. <laughs> but um, we'll see well, over the next four, four, four games where we're at. And uh, enjoy the bowl game. Enjoy your New Year's. Um, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, one of these days, uh, I will click and hear your opinion of the real OC. So um, I look forward to hearing about not all these rumors anymore. So yep. well, we'll, thank we'll you. Here in the next couple of weeks, anyways. So yeah, I appreciate. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. All right, appreciate Doug and uh, Lemansky and this with the uh, comment uh, to. Remind everybody to please hit that like button, the thumbs up button. It does help us in the algorithm. And Harpo asked the question, will Coach Close be joining tonight? He will not. He is uh, traveling home right now. I believe he was visiting some family. So uh, happy to give Gary the night off. And certainly uh, this game um, was not routine in the first half, but Iowa pulling ahead in the second half and getting the job done. We expect to have Gary back on Tuesday. Big game. Big game, as uh, Doug talked about. I know. You know, the bigger games, the must win games come after, but an opportunity to to make some amends, you know, account for what was lost against Michigan here a couple of weeks ago with a tough road environment against a really good Wisconsin team on Tuesday. Not many people are going to give much of a chance, but uh, they'll be playing with the house money, I guess, if you look at it from that perspective. I want to give a shout out to RTI Threads and their Cooper DeGene apparel. I've got my CD3 shirt on right here. Aaron Graves, Carson Shire, Aiden Hall, Zach Lutmer, all part of the RTI Threads family. And if you don't know what RTI Threads is, they're a company that that they're really advancing the Iowa NIL brands right now, the Iowa player brands. And these are just a few of their partnerships they've got going right now. All these athletes have merch lines, apparel lines, 
and RTI Threads is expanding. So Cooper to Jeans Apparel line is at cd3lacesup.com, rtithreads.com for the rest of these athletes. Cooper to Jean is going to be making an announcement uh, at some point over the next couple of weeks. And, um, you know, that's an announcement everybody will want to stay tuned to, but you have time to purchase his CD3 Laces Up apparel in the meantime. Again, cd3lacesup.com and rtithreads.com. Also, once again, want to thank Iowa Smokehouse. Talked about them at the outset. But uh, if you've not visited their website to check out their awesome selection of meat sticks, steak bites, salsas, and more, visit iowasmokehouse.com. Tasting is believing. They have got great products that uh, are fresh and, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, the crazy thing about buying anymore folks, and we all know this, but uh, when you buy from your, your name brand markets or your stores, you don't know what you're getting in your food. This is fresh, locally uh, produced, uh, cured meat. It's great stuff. Use the code Hawkeyes for 15% off your total order. Yes. Tasting is believing with Iowa Smokehouse. They're down in Albia. You can also follow them on social media at Iowa Smokehouse on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. We appreciate Iowa Smokehouse being a part of our coverage. Let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. We have got James on hold. James, welcome. What's up? How you doing? And how are you? Watching, I'm watching football at the same time, you know, because you can watch football and this at the same time. Earlier you said people are probably watching football, but you can do both at the same time. You did. You said you said it's a holiday and people are probably watching. Like at the beginning, you said. Like at the very beginning of the show, you said it's a holiday and people are probably watching football. And I was like, you can do both at the same time. No, no, no. Here's what I said. I want to make clear what I said, James. What I'm not complaining about, we you know, only having 85 people in here. So I simply said, if I was on the other side of this, a BTN plus blowout with an Iowa team that none of us really suspect is very good right now. And, you know, it's against a team that obviously doesn't defend very well. And you've got a lot of other options, including bowl games, et cetera. You know, I may not log on for the entirety of a, a show that I love. That's all I'm saying. But but you're right. You can absolutely multitask, and I appreciate you doing that. Uh, first off, let's talk about your home. I know it's not a football show, but we'll talk about your hometown team first. I think it's funny that I know they didn't have one of their best corners, but I still think it's funny they lost in retrospect of, like, they were, like, 10-point favorites. So I do think that's a little funny. But Yeah, they, uh, I, they're not my hometown team. <laughs> you live there, though, so. I live here. Yes, I do live in, in Ames. Yes, I do live in Ames, but they're not my hometown team. Um, they, they were bad defensively, and I got a lot of respect for John Haycock. And I know Don Patterson and Phil Parker have a lot of respect for John, but uh, that secondary looked bad at times tonight. And um, didn't expect that against Memphis. Did not expect that. I was pretty confident in Iowa State going down there and winning. Yeah, for sure. And I thought it was funny that Joe Skates came back to hurt him in retrospect of he transferred out there, and then he kind of had like six or seven catches. But – on to the basketball game, I feel like that's obviously what you want. But I know the last caller said they had us 13th out of 14th. I can see the reason they have us 13th out of 14th just because we haven't really proven ourselves in the big games, if that makes sense. Well, he's also referencing power rankings. And if you know how yeah, power but I'm saying, I'm saying I could, but I could understand why somebody would put us that low because we haven't really proven ourselves in games that actually matter, if that makes sense. Like, right. And pow- p- power rankings are, are based off that and your record based off recency, right? Yeah, Recent yeah. results. So, what has Iowa done recently that's impressed anybody? They've gotten blown out in every decent game they've had. So, no, I, yeah. I don't have an issue with that. Yeah, for sure. But one thing I wanted to say is I feel like it was balanced today with the kind of like the scoring-wise of like Freeman, obviously, 12 points, and then he add the uh, nine rebounds with the three blocks. I think those numbers obviously are good. He's, I know he's a freshman. And then obviously what Cricky did was good. But I like Sanford, seven rebounds, 16 points. He could have shot better, I felt like. Obviously, he didn't shoot that well. Four of ten is kind of ugly. You know, I don't really like those numbers because he's definitely a better shooter. But one name I want to talk about, and I put him in chat. Hold on on a second. Who who was four of ten? I think it said Sanford was overall. Peyton Sanford. Oh, never mind. I was looking at Patrick McCaffrey. Patrick McCaffrey was four of ten. He was – well, we know how Patrick is. I looked at the wrong one. My bad. Yeah. But Patrick needs to be better. I know we still won by what? 39? Yeah, uh, twenty nine. Peyton was, yeah. Peyton was uh, fine. Um, do I think he's some alpha male right now on this team? No. Um, in fact, he didn't shoot. What's crazy about this is he made. He was two of five from three. Only got at the free throw line two times. Had seven boards to go along with sixteen points. Pretty quiet sixteen. And I m- mentioned that our RTI Threads Player of the Game was Ben Cricky. 
Um, you know, I feel like I've repeated this exact stat line three or four times this year. Like, how often has he ended up with 20 points, seven rebounds on like nine or 12 shooting? I'll give him credit. I mean, I obviously he's consistent. At least he's, consi- he's consistent. At least you know what you're going to get from yeah, him. He's I very, feel like he's their most him consistent. And Kirky, him he's and Kirky, you kind of know what you're going to get from them. But like, yeah, he's the one thing you know you're going to get every every night. Yeah. And, and frankly, I, frankly, real quick, James, frankly, I think Owen Freeman might be their second most consistent player. Yeah, um, I can see that, especially on the defensive end, because he's not giving you – my bad, sorry. If he's not giving you nothing on the offense, he's giving you something on defense at least. Freeman is. You know, I think that's something important too. And then, I guess, in Tony was, what, 5 of 13 with 10 points, 8 assists. 8 assists is, is a really good number for him. I feel like that's something you can kind of focus on for sure. Bowen is the guy I want to kind of – like, yes, he didn't do anything else, but 15 points. If you can get 15 points from him – you take it. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to be happy with 15 points if you can get 15 points from him. Obviously, you want more assists, you know, but, like, 15 points for him is what he's done so far this year is actually surprisingly good, I feel like. I don't know how you feel, but I feel like. I would just like to see him do that against better competition. Yeah. If he does I agree with better competition, then I'll be thrilled with it. 15 is great. It's just, you know, at least we've seen Ben Cricky. We saw him do yeah. this against Creed, and we saw him do this against, what, Seton Hall. So, they got to get that type of production out of people like Desante. And how about Price Sanford? I mean, it was yeah, good to I was going to say that. Hopefully, he gets going. You yeah. said you said you've been struggling. Hopefully, three or four gets you going a little bit. And I feel like he looked better of a shooter than his brother did today, at least from deep. But I feel like it's always good to you know look this way because you know you had what finals and then they had a couple a couple of days off. One thing I thought was interesting, I was listening to both. Like I was watching it, I was listening to the radio just because I don't trust the broadcasters, you know on. BTM Plus. So I was listening to the radio at the same time. And at halftime, they were talking to Sherman Dillard, and he said the same thing that Fran said after the last game. He was like, the defense was really bad. He was like, we've been working off for two days to to how to, like, to, on the screen, like, what we want to do off the screen. So we're working on it for two days, and we didn't do it right at all. And he was like, and we gave up way too many open looks. And I was like, I mean, yes, but you're still giving up open looks. Like, you can say that. Well, he says they've been working on it for the yeah. last. They've been working on it for more than two days. But if they've been working on it, they've been working on it. I think maybe a greater percentage of practice time needs to be spent on simple defensive. I didn't think I didn't think it was good that they said they were working on it though, because I feel like that's something that you don't really hear them a lot of time saying. Yeah, yeah. Lip, lip even, service. Even, I, I get. I get you. Even if it's not true, they're at least saying it. They haven't never really said it in the past. You know, what I mean, they just. 13 years into a tenure. <laughs> Let it show, but, you know. Sorry, but just so you know, I don't know if you're watching. Ohio State's only up 3 nothing, and their quarterback is out. Um, I did see that. I, I'm not watching it right now, but I'll, I'll definitely get it on. Uh, Sports News says, uh, answer my call, Corey. W- what does this mean? I've got the call line open. The call line is open. No one's calling in. I've got the StreamYard link in the description. The number is 515-635-1601. We've got uh, Ben on hold. And we've got James on right now. So uh, I don't know what people are talking about here. Um, Esther, as far as the offensive coordinator position, I've addressed that in some videos. Um, there is no clear cut favorite right now. There are a couple people that are absolutely still in the running. Paul Christ is one of those people. Um, Joe Philbin is a guy who's been contacted. And uh, there's a couple others. So we'll see. Uh, Kirk has not made a decision on this yet, contrary to what people in certain uh, certain circles would would want you to uh, know. And I think sports news is just giving us a hard time now because there's no calls coming in. So anyways, go ahead, James. No, I was going to say, like, I feel like the upcoming schedule, like Doug said, was a little, obviously Wisconsin, you don't know what you're going to get there. You know, it could be an either or situation where it's like, it's at Wisconsin, so it can be tough. But then like Rutgers, Nebraska, Minnesota, I feel like this is the toughest for us because I don't know what team we are. And I feel like we can lose every, not, I mean, we're not going to, but I feel like we could lose every game from here on out. Yeah, they're not going to. They'll win yeah, some. Yeah, games. they're not going to, but I f- you just feel like you know there's a chance that they could, you know, and I feel like that's something we haven't felt in a while. The floor is a lot lower than it ever yeah. has been. Or I shouldn't say ever, but in the last five, six years, it's as low as it's ever been. You're right. Absolutely. And and that part of that is youth, and part of that is, you know, lack of an alpha male um, scorer and takeover guy. They just don't have that go-to guy this year yet, and I don't know that that go-to guy is going to show his yeah. face at any point. I just don't know who that would be. 
Yep, for sure. And one more thing before I get off, it was good to see Lache come back. I think that was something I expected at least was for Lachey to come back. I didn't see a reason why he would not come back, especially after that. But hopefully we get some more good news on that. And I just want us to have a good showing against Tennessee. You know, I remember happened last time we played Tennessee, it wasn't I know this it wasn't like an opt out situation where a lot of people were opting out, but I remember last time we played Tennessee in a bowl game, it wasn't very pretty. So No, it was not. I watched part I of that game again the other night and uh no, it was not. <laughs> I don't want to repeat of that, you know. At least give me some enjoyment, you know. Especially since it's the last iteration, we're gonna watch some of these players up there for sure. Like obviously, a lot of them are coming back, but you know, like Nico and everybody else we put out there. So it'll be fun to see. Hopefully, we can make a better showing than at least Iowa State did. I know they put up points, but like you said earlier, they did not look very good. So I remember, brother. Uh, you gonna be calling in after the women tomorrow? Uh, what time is that game at? 1 p.m. Yeah, I should be fine. Then. I was gonna watch the Cowboys game at night, so if it was a currently Cowboys game, I wasn't gonna pay attention. But all right, we'll we'll talk to you tomorrow afternoon. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, James. Um, so uh, Barbara in the chat says, "Will there ever be a good defense in Iowa men's basketball with Fran as our coach?" They had some decent defenses, Barbara. If you look back at some of the early teams, especially with Adam Woodbury, Mike Gasell, Anthony Clemens, and maybe it's because they weren't quite playing the way Fran wanted to play yet. But those were good teams that played good defense. Now, those were not teams that made it to the Sweet 16. Nobody has. So they obviously lacked other things, right? That's a great question. How long will Fran be here? That's a you know a question I don't have the answer for. Justin says, I will gift 10 memberships if you answer his call. Well, uh, you better gift those 10 memberships, Justin, because I've answered every call that's come in. But uh, anyways, um, Kerry says it's hard to deny the defense is bad when they show us in every game it needs help. Uh, that's that's fair. Kyle, I appreciate you being a member, a premium member here at the uh, channel. He says that this team gets blown out at home by a bad Michigan team. It's going to be a long year with some great moments. This is not an NCAA or NIT team. He adds, to be honest, this year's team is about a 500 team. That's okay, just a rebuild year. You could be right. We'll we'll see how things play out. Again, going from 0 to 60 on Tuesday against Wisconsin. They've had plenty of prep and warm-up time. I'm tired of seeing you know, G5 schools, mid-majors. Let's get to some real basketball. And if Iowa stinks, they stink. You know, Just move on, right? Get better. And, and we got the women to watch, and I'm not going to stop watching the men, but they're going to have some growing pains with this young roster. Barbara says, did you go to college at Iowa? If not, how'd you become a Hawkeye fan living in Ames? I did not go to school at Iowa, Barbara. I grew up in Marshalltown, which is right in the heart of state, uh, the state of Iowa. And um, I was just around Hawkeye fans a lot growing up. I was actually closer to Ames uh, in high school and uh, um, as a child. And uh, just ended up going to a lot of Iowa games growing up. And uh, neither of my parents were real big Iowa fans, but I just kind of took to them and... Uh, haven't looked back. I am not an Iowa State hater. You know, at one time I probably claimed to be, but I, I'm certainly not an Iowa State hater. But a fair question, uh, Barbara. Thank you for that. Uh, Ari Gold is here. Dino Chef is here as well. Dino Chef's being a little bit hard on Adam Woodbury. Adam Woodbury was a good defender, Dino Chef. Go back and look at those teams. They, those were good defensive teams. And I think it's unfair to say that he was not a good rim protector. Um, he was not a good offensive player, not a great offensive player, but he did. He was a good defender inside. I think uh, compared to some of the bigs that we've had since that I was had since even some of the better scoring bigs like, you know, Ryan Creener, Luca Garza. Um, I mean, Adam Woodbury would be a welcomed addition on this team. He has made I know he's not playing in the NBA, but he has made it in the G League for a long time. I think he's still on a roster as far as I know. Uh, let's go to our next Iowa Smokehouse caller. Ben is on hold. Ben, welcome. Hey, Corey. Um, so it was it was just nice, you know, to see, um, you know, you know, Price hitting those shots. You know, I really feel like he, he got his confidence back. And it was just it was nice to see him, you know, hitting those shots, you know, because he's been in a real slump lately. So I just it was I just feel like it was nice to see him. They have not had a game like this from him since I think the exhibition, and they need him to shoot threes. Um, if he can turn into somewhat of a consistent three point threat, it will really help come Big Ten play. Yeah, I also feel like Patrick sometimes like forces shots up. Like I feel like sometimes like today he was forcing shots um, that he shouldn't have just passed out or something. So I agree. Yeah, uh, I wish Patrick crashed more. I wish Patrick wasn't so dependent on the fast break, but. 
you know, at some point it is what it is. He's never going to be an elite three point shooter. Um, he's a guy who does run into the lane and kind of throw up crazy shots. Sometimes they go in, sometimes they don't again. Um, uh, it ain't changing four years in, but I get your frustration. Yeah. And uh, over to football now, you know, it was just, it was nice to see, you know, Luke Deshay and Che Higgins coming back in. Um, uh, do you, do you expect, uh, Jamar Harris, uh, to come back at all too? I don't have any intel on Jamari, but based on just trying to discern, read between the lines, I would think he would. I think he needs another year to come back unless he enters the portal. I don't expect that to happen. Um, I think he'll be back. And I think, you know, I don't know about Sebastian Castor. I'd probably lean towards him leaving, but I don't have intel on either one of those guys. Uh, I figured I talked about Jay Higgins and Luke Lachey. Neither of those guys coming back was uh, much of a surprise. I was a little bit surprised that Jay Higgins announced when he announced. Um, but it was nice to see Luke and Jay uh, both announced before the bowl game. But I don't know. As far as Jamar Harris is concerned, he ought to come back because I think he needs another year. He needs a healthy year where he plays a full season. Yeah, I feel like with Quinn, too, he needs uh, – I feel like he should come back, too, because like I feel like he could have made the NFL, but I'm not really sure. And I feel like that him and Wampa back would just be you know a great duo, too. I don't think Quinn's getting drafted. If, if Quinn's going to make it in the league, he's going to have to make it as a free agent. So I agree. Um, yeah. I don't know what the percentages would say, but I would think coming back, getting another year under his belt, probably as a starter, um, you know, perhaps he can get a little bit bigger. He's never going to be some daunting looking DB, but uh, another year in the Phil Parker system, that will certainly help the resume. People have a lot of respect for Phil's players. Um, you know, maybe he gets into a roster after this next year uh, and, and they could use him back. I mean, I, I think they'd yeah. be okay at that position. If he leaves, I think they're real confident in Cohen and Tringer and, you know, the guys behind him, but uh, it'd be nice to get some experience back on, on the back end. Yeah, it was just nice to, you know, see, like I said before, you know, Price getting his confidence back because, you know, that's really what he needed. You know, he he really hasn't, you know, been playing, you know, that well um, these past few games. So it was really just nice to see him, you know, getting his his um, his um shot back. Absolutely. Ben, you didn't have to turn off your camera. You're more than welcome to have your camera on. No, nah, it's all good. Okay. Well, I appreciate you calling in, sir. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully, if we don't talk to you tomorrow after the women's game, we'll talk to you Tuesday or All right, Monday. See ya. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate Ben calling in. And let's see, um, we've got a couple of things here in the chat. I want to make sure we didn't miss. And I uh, want to give another shout out to RTI Threads. I'm wearing the Cooper DeGene apparel. I talked about his apparel line. Again, it's at rtithreads.com and cd3lacesup.com. You can find all of these awesome Iowa football player athletes over at rtithreads.com. They've all got apparel lines through RTI Threads. Aaron Graves, Carson Shire, Aiden Hall, Zach Lutmer, and RTI Threads expanding into some different sports. Marty over at RTI doing great stuff and uh, helping Iowa Athletics along the way. CD3LacesUp.com for Cooper DeGene's apparel. RTI Threads with uh, Aaron Graves, Carson Shire, Aiden Hall, Zach Lummer, and more. Go Hawks, courtesy of RTI Threads. Let's go back to our, I think, our final caller of the night. Thank you for calling our Iowa postgame from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Who's on the line? Me. Lomansky, how are you? I'm good. The world's kind of weird. My... Uh... I've got a lot of Iowa State friends growing up in cattle country, Northeast Iowa, and my buddy in Las Vegas, he won money betting against the Cyclones, and he called me up this evening. He says, I'm going the money line on the Hawkeyes football game, so the world's pretty weird. Um, yeah, I'm not into the betting world, but uh, boy, uh, that game caught me by I'm glad I'm not a betting man because that game, the, the football game caught me by surprise, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people who – if there were actually people betting on Iowa basketball, I'm sure a lot of people had sweaty palms in that first half. Did you catch by chance the, the, it's uh, Brian with Logan, our center. Did you catch that question back and forth? I've not watched it all the way through. I saw a couple quotes. I have not watched the video all the way through. It's a question. And I, you know, you're the journalist, you're the, you got a better sense of what questions to ask Brian, but he got a lot of questions about his last year, but it was interesting that Marco got brought up again. If there's any circumstances or reasons, and I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me, but you know, what circumstances would uh, bring him in the game? And he just, he'd be, you know, I'm not quoting Brian, but it just sounded like, 
he's done a good job and he's going to be there. It expects him to like a horse race, ride him to the finish line. And I don't get that with all the turnovers we've had at quarterback position. I mean, it's called an inability. I, it's called an inability to evaluate. And I think it's a fear of being proven wrong. I think that's what it is. You can't explain doubling down on Deacon Hill after what we've seen over the last seven to eight games out of him. It's it's complete um, incompetence as it relates to evaluating quarterbacks. And you know, I'm not that I'm not trying to sound vindictive, but uh, I, I don't feel an ounce of sadness that Brian is leaving. I don't. I don't feel sorry for him. Um, if you don't perform at a job, you, you don't deserve to retain said job. Uh, he has given a lot to Iowa. Iowa has given a lot to him. And I understand the quarterback de- decisions are not strictly on Brian Ferentz, but he is the offensive coordinator. He is the quarterback's coach. To make a statement like that, like, no, I don't see any reason to even give Marco a shot because uh, Deacon's played good football for us and and won a lot of games for us. That's just ignorant or dishonest, disingenuous, one of the two. And I don't know which one it is, but I, I was I was absolutely flabbergasted. And I was honestly, Lemansky, when I heard that statement by Brian earlier today, again, I just read the quote, haven't listened to the whole thing. I was ashamed. I was ashamed that this is where we're at, that the Iowa program is is here right now, where, you know, having a guy who turns the ball over, throws for 38 yards, had one of the worst completion percentages in the country, or had the worst completion percentage in the country of any quarterback that was actually playing significant snaps for much of the season, and you're going to sit here and try to act like he was a big part of winning games. No, the truth is, Lemansky, Iowa, just like they did under Spencer Petras and the leadership of Deacon Hill, they have been winning games for four years in spite of quarterback play, not because of it. Just father at all. And I'm glad reason I called in, I, I felt bad about myself because I'm glad you went on that summary because when I got done hearing that, I kind of walked around my place and thought, don't let the door hit in your ass. And I felt bad about me, you know, like, like, if you ever get a chance to hear Joe Buck interview uh, Notre Dame's head coach, he's 80 now, and now his name flips my mind, but, uh, oh, the older Notre Dame coach, Lou Holtz. I urge everybody to, to get on the Internet and find an interview that Joe Buck does with Lou Holtz and his positive and how he learned from everybody else through his whole life and grew up poor. And I think Brian just, he came kind of with a golden spoon in his mouth and think, you know, I learned from you, Corey. Did you know that? I'm a lot older than you, but I learned from you because, because your sense of integrity and journalism to come on your show and say, don't listen to all these crazy journalists that say, who's the next offensive coordinator when any guy with the brain would listen to Kurt talk about it and he's not going anything out of the bag till after the bowl game because that's his second gear and how he does things so I I just want to compliment you on coming on your podcast and saying folks everybody just R-E-L-A-X well I appreciate that Lemansky and and to take that a step further it's not I want to clear something up it's not a matter of Kirk keeping things under wraps until after the bowl game, he has not offered the job to anyone. He's not offered the job to anybody. And my understanding is he's not decided on anybody. So these people that keep saying how, ah, this guy's going to get hired. I've got a source. So that's news to Kirk Ferentz (laughs) because Kirk didn't know. But um, (laughs) yeah, anyways, um, I appreciate those words, Lemansky, and uh, we'll get an announcement on the coordinator position. I'm so happy that they're getting a new coordinator. And I, even if it is a good friend of Kirk Ferentz's like a Paul Christ, I hope, I hope, I hope that that individual is able to help Kirk evolve, even in his, you know, close to retirement age, where he's comfortable kind of standing back and saying, hey, I don't know much about the passing game. I don't know much about quarterback play because he doesn't. He knows a lot more than I do, a lot more than you do, Lemansky, but in general, 
He's not a quarterback's coach. He would admit that. He is he has admitted in the past that he doesn't really know a whole lot about the passing game. So somebody needs to be a part of this program that understands the passing game, understands play calling, and they do not have it and have not had it with Mr. Brian Ferentz. And that's why I don't have much sympathy for the situation right now. I just don't. I'm kind of don't let the door hit you in the ass. I'm sorry. I just feel that way after I heard him talk. And I want to one of the strengths of their show is you bring a lot of people in, whether it's football, basketball, women's basketball, you never heard the gal that ended up being assistant coach. And Tom Caker was pretty classy. Uh, I think those interviews were today, but they had all these questions at Brian. And I thought, you know, let's just move on and talk about, you know, Logan's up there, not getting a question. And I'd rather hear what Logan has to say than Brian by, I mean, that's common sense to me. And, Tom Caker was the first guy to ask Logan, our center, a question. And Brian Friends thanked Tom Caker. And you get quality people that do things the right way. And if you talk to Tom Caker, tell him there's a caller that was very appreciative of him asking a Hawkeye football player that's going to play in a bowl game the first question. I thought it was a classy move by Tom. And with that, I'll uh, let somebody else to get on and talk with you. Well, appreciate the phone call, Lomansky. And, uh, we don't talk to you tomorrow. We'll talk to you on Monday as well. Yeah, have a good evening. Thank you, sir. Yep. Uh, people know I, I'm a big fan of Tom Kakerts. He does a great job and been around the beat for a long time. I'm sure he and I don't always see eye to eye on certain things, but um, I think Tom knows that I'm genuine and I'm objective uh, as much as I can, right? As best he can covering the sport that he loves. So I do appreciate the kind words from uh, Lomansky. Lori. We will find out who the new OC is when the time is right. No, that's fair. Absolutely fair. Chris says, uh, nepotism. Brian should have never had the job. He was mediocre at best. Had no objectivity. Kirk didn't have any objectivity regarding Brian's performance. Absolutely the case as it relates to the, the offensive coordinator position. I have no issue with, uh, with Kirk bringing him on in the beginning. Because Kirk understood that Brian... Uh, yes, you can call it nepotism if you want. But Brian did pay some dues at New England. Uh, did he deserve to be promoted as the OC, certainly as a quarterback's coach? No. Never in a million years. No. 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 Anyways, um, we'll talk more about football, I'm sure. I'll talk more about football tomorrow. We've got women's basketball tomorrow. Keep in mind, folks, that I will be live talking about Iowa and Minnesota, the women. That game tips off at 1 p.m. Central Time tomorrow, BTN. That's Saturday, uh, 1 p.m. Central Time on BTN. Support the show by signing up for a free trial of Aura. Visit Aura.com slash Hawkeyes. Enter your information. And Aura will protect all of that personal information. And you can do so with a free trial. And just see what it's like. And if you like it, stay locked in. If not, no problem. You can cancel your subscription without a dollar down. Again, Aura.com slash Hawkeyes to support the show and protect your personal information. Uh, again, the Hawkeyes defeating Northern Illinois today. The men, 103 to 74, behind a 20.7 rebound performance by uh, none other than Ben Cricky. Uh, Iowa also added 12 points and nine boards from Owen Freeman. Uh, Tony Perkins was in double figures with 10 points. Josh Dix had eight points. Peyton Sanford had 16 points along with seven rebounds, all of which came on the defensive end. Asante Bowen had 15 points on the night. On five of eight shooting, Price Sanford came in, knocked down a few threes, ended with 12 points. Patrick McCaffrey, nine points, two boards. Brock Harding played just 13 minutes, did add three assists to one turnover and one point. Um, and let's see, Elaji Dembele did play tonight after being held out uh, recently due to, I believe, due to an illness. He finished tonight uh, logging just over eight minutes and two rebounds. Evan Bronze got in late, as did Carter Kingsbury, Spencer Hutchison, Javon, uh, Javon Cater, and Luke Laquetta. Those guys are, are walk-ons on this team. Uh, they all played late in the contest as well. The Hawkeyes ended just with seven, seven turnovers in the night, 23 to seven assisted turnover ratio. They play fast. Those are numbers you can live with. The Hawkeyes put up 54 points in the first half. It's the sixth time the Hawkeyes have scored 50 points in a half. And this is the second straight game in which they've eclipsed the 100-point mark. The Hawkeyes had six players reach double figures for the uh, second time this season. Had at least four players in double figures in nine different games. Excuse me, ten different games now after today. After giving up 48 points in the first half, Iowa limited 
NIU to 60 or excuse me, 26 second half points on 29% shooting. So some of those defensive woes in the first half did seem to be corrected to an extent, but they got to get put together 40 solid minutes to be some of the better teams in this conference moving forward. Um, Iowa finished the game with 23 assists, 42 field goals. Those are really good numbers. They're six and one now when handing out at least 20 assists. They finished with a season high 15 steals and nine blocks, which was also a season high. The team had a season high 38 fast break points tonight without much resistance from that NIU transition defense. Uh, again, they made eight threes. They're now five and one when making at least eight threes. They shot 50% from the field for the seventh time this season. They actually lost a game when they shot 50% or more. That might've been the Creighton game. I'm guessing it was the Creighton game, but they're six and one overall when they shoot at least 50% from the field. Um, this is Fran McCaffrey's 269th career victory. He's three wins from becoming the winningest coach in Iowa history. Very interesting. Iowa has now won 89 of its last 95 non-conference games, home games, non-conference home games, dating back to 2012, uh, early years of the Fran McCaffrey era. Uh, Iowa is now 6-1 and one at home. They'll be back in action on Tuesday to face the top 25 uh, Wisconsin Badgers, 6 p.m. Central uh, time start at the Kohl Center over on BTN. Um, let's see a couple of more things in our chat. I'll make sure we've got everybody. Esther, I'm doing well. Thank you for being here. Hope you're doing well too. And, um, let's see if the, is there something else here? I think we talked to Ben earlier, but Ben, do you have something else for us? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that, um, I just, I just think that Brian should have promo been promoted to a line coach in the first place. I mean, he's coaching quarterbacks, you know, a position that he, he never, he did not play at Iowa. So I just think that he should have been a line coach in the first place because, you know, he played on line in Iowa. So I just feel like that he should have never been a quarterback coach. I agree with you hundred percent. I would have no issue with him coaching the run game would have no issue with him coaching tight ends. He got experience coaching tight ends at new England. And uh, obviously with his experience with the O line. Yeah. Why not? But uh, the guy has no experience prior to Iowa coaching quarterbacks are certainly scheming up a passing game. Do you think Iowa could go after Drew Tate as the quarterback's coach, possibly? Do I think – could they? Uh, sure, they could. Um, I don't think that will happen simply because um, – I don't think it's anything against Drew Tate. I think they're going to hire a combo guy that, that coaches quarterbacks and can coach the passing game and be the coordinator, which I think is probably what they should do. And if they don't do that, unfortunately – I don't like this, but I think they're probably going to get somebody who's coaching – a different position, they'll let somebody go or somebody will retire, and then they'll bring in a guy like John Budmeyer, the full-time assistant. I don't think they're going to bring Drew Tate. I've got no indication that that's he's not been on the board that I've heard of. I think they're going to bring in an OC slash QBs guy. Yeah, I like. I know what you mean by. Um, I think like with uh, Paul Chris too. You know, he he coached quarterbacks of Wisconsin. Um, I I definitely think that Budmeyer and um, Chris are you know my my top candidates for for OC, and I think that you know they. I'd rather have them coaching quarterbacks than Brad Ferentz because, you know, they, they play well, the agree. position. They know what it's like and, you know. Absolutely. All right, I'll see you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I'd rather have Budmeyer coaching quarterbacks than Brian Ferentz. And let's just make something clear. John Budmeyer was coaching quarterbacks this year, and he was coaching quarterbacks. Let's see. Was he coaching quarterbacks a year ago? I believe he was. So, I mean, that's the argument that could be made. Like, we haven't seen much improvement, but there's no question. I think him as a full-time coach, he could be on the sidelines and actually interacting on game day would help. But I think there are better options available, but I'm not involved in the interview process. Lemansky says, let's go Hawks. Support this show's sponsors. Thank you, Lemansky. Appreciate the super chat as well, sir. All of our sponsors are in our description. Please support our sponsors because you don't support the sponsors. Uh, the show won't happen. Joe can't go on. So thank you for reminding us to do that, Lemansky. And let's go on again, I think, is our final caller of the night. Thank you for calling our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Who's on the line? Hey, Corey, this is Zach. How's it going? Good, Zach. How are you? Pretty good. It's kind of an unimpressive 100-point night tonight. <laughs> uh, well, it's, yeah. It's kind of like uh, watching an NBA game. <laughs> well, that might be going a little bit far. I, I watch more NBA than uh, I think most people, and – the quality of play on offense in a game like this um, is nowhere close to the quality of play in the NBA. But I get what you're saying. A lot of up and down, not much defense. Yeah, there are similarities. Yep. Sure. Parallels. <laughs> yeah, and uh, 
Yeah, I'm not. I, I know other people says I'm not the biggest fan of of Tony being at the one. I don't think he's a natural point guard. Um, but yeah, I think this team, just like you guys, that's going to be an up and down year. Uh, hoping they'll be 500 it is a rebuilding year. Um, but the question that I kind of have, I, I didn't know about what was happening in Illinois until someone just told me. But with the whole, you know, with what happened with Iowa, with all the gambling stuff last last winter and fall, and with obviously the stuff happening in Illinois and probably other stuff happening in other schools, how soon will it be until potentially these schools start hiring people to keep tabs on kids, especially with NIL, because money can bring out the best and worst of people. Well, I don't think there's any reason to believe that Terrence Shannon's uh, situation, specifically allegations, had anything to do with lack of oversight. I mean, how even right. with, well before the NIL era, I mean, look at back at the Pierre Pierce situation. Yeah. Um, that was a totally different era. Kids are going to be kids and people are going to, by the way, these are not all kids. Most of these kids are 18 to 23 year olds. Yeah. So they're adults legally and uh, they're accountable as adults. So, I mean, I get what you're saying. I think there needs to be more oversight, or not mm-hmm. oversight, but assistance as it relates to financial advising and uh, just help with managing money for these young guys. But I, I unfortunately, things like this are going to happen, and you know, it's just an unfortunate part of society. And you know, I think mm-hmm. the the bigger question, specifically as it relates to the allegations with um, the guy from from Illinois. Terrence Shannon Jr., I think more more so goes toward, for me, uh, regardless of what's true and what's not true, there needs to be more um, sexual, sexual assault awareness campaigns at various schools. And I know a lot of university police departments, I know here in Ames, the Iowa State University Police Department has tried to work on that, but there are so many sexual assault reports. I mean, people have no idea how many reports these departments get on a week in and week out basis and very few arrests right. and charges are, are very rarely filed. And, um, you know, some of them I'm sure are false claims. There's going to be some false claims mixed in there, but you know, there are things that happen that, uh, mm. unfortunately there's not enough evidence to charge a person. There just needs to be more awareness on a number of levels. But again, um, this is the world we live in right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. I agree with you 100%. And, you know, I, Obviously, too, you can't can't fault the coaches as well either because they can't be the babysitter either. Now, I know Alford was a whole other thing because I think he tried to cover it up. But, um, yeah, like you said, it's kind of the world we live in. I wish that, you know, I think the NFL, but that's this is the NFL. They have their rookie symposium where they try to tell those the new draftees, hey, you're going to be making a lot of money. You need to stay away from these people, these people know who you're around because you never know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of, um, I don't think young people are guided enough in the ways they need to be guided, if that makes sense. And, you know, th- th- we see the fruits of those things, unfortunately. Yeah. But like I said, another, another win for them, for the men. Hopefully the, I know Minnesota women have actually are, are decently good this year. But yeah. They, really haven't played, they really, they really haven't played anybody, but they, Right. won a lot of games so we'll see we'll, there'll be a litmus test tomorrow right and i think they play michigan state after which is kind of the same thing they really haven't played many people but they have a decent record yep. so i mean big 10 whether it's the women's or the men's there's no there's no e quote-unquote easy victories really because yep. you're playing a big 10 opponent definitely not, like not, you're de- facing... definitely not for the men <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely not for the men. yeah i, th- I mean there might be at least on the women's side, I think Northwestern is really not that good. There might be one or two women's Big Ten teams that might be "quote unquote" pushovers. But as I, as the I women found out last week or the week before, you take every team seriously because they came out that last game and did not look good. Yep, absolutely. So you're going to be at the game and, tomorrow, Zach? Yep, I plan on being there. So, and yeah. and I I really hope either. I really hope Sharon and Addie can get themselves out of their group funks. And I don't know. I still don't understand why Lisa does not play O'Grady any. I mean, she gets in for like two garbage minutes to get a bucket and then they take her out. Yeah. I don't know. We're, we're not there behind closed doors, but something, 
yeah. It's it's not like it's not like Lisa Bluter has built up some <clears throat> reputation for not playing her best players or or players that seem to be in position to contribute. <clears throat> um, so uh, that seems a, a bit odd to me as well. But yeah, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and I know that. she's somewhat she somewhat cuts down her rotations during Big Ten season, but at the same time. You know, they're going to be going up against a couple of good centers, um, Mackenzie Holmes in Indiana, and I think it's Mikolashikova at Ohio State. They need one of those. They need both of them for both those games. They can't just depend on that small lineup all the time anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And and Gabby's, I hope she can get going too. Gabby, um, uh, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know what If she's healthy. Is there. I don't know if she's still sick or not, but if she's healthy. Yep. I agree. Um, maybe, maybe Lisa just should tell her play every game. Like it's the big 10 tournament. Cause that's when she seems to get on her hot streaks. Yeah. Well, we better hope that, that she turns that on all of a sudden in March. It'd be nice if she could turn yeah, it on sooner than that. Yes. Cause some of these games, whether it's against Indiana, Ohio state or Maryland, they're going to need someone besides Caitlin and Kate and Hannah to, to score. Yep. They can't just depend on the three. Agreed. But, yep, yeah, a good win tonight. Hopefully the women win tomorrow, and then the football team hopefully will win on Monday. <laughs> okay, Zach. We'll uh, look forward to chatting with you again. Yep, have a nice evening. Thank you, sir. All right, I got to address one more thing here. Kyle, love you. Appreciate you being a subscriber and a, a premium member. However, I disagree with your comment here. So he says, uh, Corey, I know you say the Brian Ferentz era is the worst for offense, but statistically, Greg Davis was the absolute worst. Well, let me read you some numbers here, uh, Kyle. Uh, let's start in the 2012 year. That was Greg Davis's first year. They were terrible. 124 teams. It was his first year with the program. They were 117 in total offense. Now, in 2013, they took a significant step forward. They were 84th in total offense in 2013. In 2014, they were 66th. In total offense. In 2015, they were 72nd in total offense. Now, in his last year, he was bad. Again, another bad year. 121 in total offense. And I'm not about to make injury excuses for Greg Davis because even though James Van, excuse me, Matt Vandenberg went down with a, a broken foot in 2016. In 2012, they lost two of their best offensive linemen, uh, Andrew Denal and uh, Brandon Scherf. Um, to me, that's no excuse for Iowa's abysmal offense over the last several years. But keep this in mind. I just read a bunch of numbers. You had a, a year of 84th overall, a year of 66th overall, and a year of 72nd overall. Two years where you're almost close to what we've seen under Brian. But listen to these numbers under Brian Ferentz. 2017, 117th in total offense. 2018, 92nd. 2019, 99th. 2020, 88th COVID year, 2021, 124th, 2022, 130th, 2023, 131st. Okay. Now, I mean, look at if we want to look at the mean or look at the median of those, um, I don't know that uh, those numbers would bear out to what you're saying, but uh, neither were great hires. I think that's fair to be, to, to say. And, and, you know, at least Greg Davis knew how to develop quarterbacks, and there were guys that were developed on his watch. I would give him a lot of credit for what happened with C.J. Beathard. I think you got to give him credit for developing Nate Stanley for at least a year. Um, you know, maybe you give him some credit for Jake Rudock. He went off to Michigan, had a nice year there, and even Cody Sokol ended up transferring out of the program during the Greg Davis era and played at uh, Louisiana Tech. Iowa's not had any quarterback success under Brian Ferentz. None. They have not had any. Uh, Nate Stanley had three good years, but again, he was he came in at the same time that Brian did. Never really got better, I didn't think, from 2017 to 2019. We saw very little to no improvement from Spencer Peters from 2020 to 2022. And have you seen any improvement from Deacon Hill over the last eight games? I have not. So, you know, with, besides the fact that he's not airmailing as many balls and, you know, he's completing more passes, at better passing completion percentage. But in general, like the offensive numbers, the passing numbers are absolutely abysmal. So anyways, we can have that debate some other time. But uh, 
I figured I would just address it real quick. I will be back tomorrow, folks, for Iowa women's basketball postgame coverage. The men defeating Northern Illinois tonight, 103-74. to Please support our sponsors. If you're interested in sponsoring the show, please reach out to me from the eye of the storm at outlook.com. From the eye of the storm at outlook.com. You can also donate to the channel, Pay- PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, if you want to donate by credit card, one time or a recurring credit card donation. That would be appreciated. Just click the PayPal link in the description below. Have a great night, folks. We'll talk to you tomorrow.